and Development, and I'm Chris Metcalf, Sequoia's Director of Development Experience. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the background behind Open Data and our Open Data APIs, some of the functionality you can get, and then once you've started building your application, how you can get help uh, and get it into the Socrata application marketplace. So first, let's talk a little bit about who the heck we are and what we do here at Socrata. So at Socrata, what we like to do is build software to make data more useful to more people. And what that means is building the best experience possible for all the different constituencies that like to use open data. Um, you know, your, the, the experience that you're looking for as a developer using an API is very different than what you know, your mom and dad, uh, the normal citizen, might be looking for in order to interact with data. So we provide different experiences for that. We have open data APIs for developers. We have bulk data resources and tools for journalists and analysts. Uh, and we also have apps and data exploration tools for normal citizens. So we tailor our, um, the experience we give people with open data to whatever their particular needs and skills are. We believe that greater access to public data makes cities better places to live. Uh, and we really hold our customers to that account. We like to uh, try and figure out new and creative ways to uh, reuse open data in order to help people learn about their cities, help them uh, push cities to improve uh, the citizen, uh, citizens' everyday lives. And then also, we like, one of the things I love about the developer community is you guys get to do that too by using open data in API, uh, via our APIs as well. So to that end, we make it easy for governments to share their public data with civic developers. We make it really easy for non-technical government employees to get their data into the Socrata platform. Uh, and on top of that, we automatically roll out the Socrata API tools that you guys are looking for without them having to spend a bunch of money uh, and build out a bunch of technology to provide API to themselves. So one of the common questions people have is what kind of data is out there? We have about 150 um, local, state, county, federal, agency, international customers around the world. So it's difficult to, uh, to give you one single list of all of the different data sets that are available. But what we have done recently is started using machine learning to categorize this data set. What we found is that data falls along several primary lines. Uh, one of the most common types of data we see is budget and spending data. So data about uh, what a city has budgeted for different departments and different projects, and then what it ends up spending on those projects. It's a great way of learning about where money is flowing uh, through governments, where it comes from, where it goes to, and possibly finding um, you know, creative ways to save money or to reduce uh, fraud in government as well. Another popular uh, category is policing and crime. So details about uh, where uh, cops are going on police beats, details about where crimes are happening, uh, details about uh, 911 calls that are happening in cities. This really helps citizens understand uh, where the problems are, and it can also help governments figure out better how to target uh, you know, their limited resources in order to be more successful at keeping this system safe. Uh, health and public safety is another huge category, especially with one of our large customers being uh, HHS and the federal government. So data about uh, what hospitals are best to go for, what particular conditions, where, what kinds of health care is available from healthcare.gov, um, as well as uh, at the local level, uh, data about uh, what restaurants uh, and nursing homes um, have been deemed safe versus what might have, which might have issues and violations in their inspections. Another big category is transportation and geospatial. A lot of our data uh, is around the vein of uh, things like where there are subway routes. In New York City, we have a lot of data about subway routes and stops. Uh, in Chicago, we have data about traffic. Um, geospatial data in general is also very popular. So things like uh, you know, county boundaries, neighborhoods, uh, building footprints, bus routes, all the kinds of things that you can use along with other data to help uh, citizens understand what's going on. So what can you build? Uh, one of the things I wanted to do in this talk as well was talk a little bit about some inspiration of the different kind of apps that you can, you can build using the Socrata API. So I've picked out a few of my favorites uh, and uh, we'll talk through those right now. The first one is called Citygram. It's a great project from Code from America that uses uh, real-time data around the things that are happening in your neighborhood uh, and then allows you to set up notifications based on that. So with Citigram, I can put in my address of my home or my work uh, and then it'll notify me whenever there is a fire or a police call or uh, a new building permit issued in that area and it'll send me a text message or an email. 
So it's a really great way of keeping up to date about what's going on in your neighborhood without having to expend a lot of effort. And it also focuses right on the areas you care about most. So you don't necessarily need to learn about every single building permit around the entire city. You can just subscribe to areas that matter most to you. Uh, Look at Cook is a great example of a visualization app. So this is an app built in Chicago that takes uh, open data uh, about the, the Cook County budget uh, and visualizes it in a much easier to understand way. So rather than looking at a big spreadsheet full of budget items and whether or not they were approved and how much money was spent, they take all that data and they build it into a, a simple UI where you can look by uh, basically fund type or, uh, or department and learn how big their budgets are, what kind of projects they're working on, and how they're doing uh, at spending accurately to their budgets. Uh, on a larger scale, uh, one of the great ones that we've seen recently is the reuse of health data within big companies like Yelp. So Yelp went ahead and took the restaurant inspection data uh, in uh, San Francisco and several other large cities, and they're including it in the, um, the actual profile page for restaurants when you go look up their profiles in Yelp. So if you go, you're deciding to whether or not to go to this particular Mexican restaurant uh, in, uh, in San Francisco, uh, you can see that it got a 93 out of 100 on its health inspection, and you can even see what kind of violations it has. So rather than waiting until after you have food poisoning to uh, decide whether or not to go to a particular restaurant, you can decide in real time whether or not that place is safe to eat at. So let's talk a little bit about what you're really here to learn about, which is the actual Socrata Open Data APIs. Our data open data APIs have two basic faces. There's the consumer APIs, which we develop for uh, open data users like you guys. Uh, and then there's the publisher APIs that our customers use. This topic is going to, this session is going to focus entirely on the consumer APIs. There are other webinars we have that talk more about how our publishers get data into the platform. So the first step you'll need to do is find data. Uh, based on your questions, it sounds like most of you guys already have some experience um, and have particular open data sites you're looking to reuse. Uh, but if you haven't found one for your local area, one good place to start is uh, in the listing of all the public open data sets that we host. So if you go to dev.sorcredo.com slash data, uh, right now it's just a redirect to a data set, but we actually have a data set of uh, all of our customer data sites that you can go check out. So you can find one that's in your area, learn more about it, uh, and hopefully find some data sets uh, there as well. Once you have a data set that you want to reuse, um, you need to find its API endpoint. So every data set has a unique uh, URL that you will interact with uh, in order to make RESTful requests against that data set. Uh, they all follow a similar template, which is slash resource slash identifier, which is either a 4.4 uh, ID that is assigned by our systems for the data set or a um, kind of a, a, sh a short friendly name provided by the data publisher. They're really easy to get actually from the user interface. You can just grab them from the export sidebar under SOTA API and the, the full uh, API endpoint is right there. Let's uh, go and actually go to the New York City site. New York. And let's find a data set that we want to work with. So let's take a look at about environments. Right. And then let's find green markets. That looks interesting. Actually, natural gas. Let's try that one. Okay. So within this data set, I can go into the export sidebar, click on Soda API, grab the URL, and I can start working with that. So once you have your API endpoint, you want to start issuing queries against it. The simplest way you can filter it, filter using what I call simple filters, which basically are just query parameters you add to that RESTful URL in order to filter the output of the data. Let me show you how that works using this is a tool called Perl. It's a great way of testing out RESTful web APIs by making direct HTTP requests. So I'm going to paste in that URL that I grabbed from that sidebar, uh, data that city of New York, slash resource, slash identifier, uh, you can also see the extension that's placed on that. That is a shortcut way of determining what output type you want to get. So we're going to be experimenting with JSON here. 
Uh, and uh, I'll show you also how you can manipulate that to get other output types. So if I want to just grab that bare API, I just did a get request. You can see the JSON structure of the of the data that we provide here. So every for those, for those unfamiliar with JSON, the brackets mean an array, basically a collection of entries, and then the curly brackets uh, are each individual object within there. The uh, the field names in this JSON structure are equivalent to the column headers in the data set. So if I look in the sidebar here, you'll see the columns that are provided by the data set. So zip code, building type, consumption, utility data source. You can also mouse over the little eye icon and it'll show you what the field name for that particular column is. So the schema of the data set in Socrata uh, determines the schema of the API that you get out of it. Um, so if I go back to my data set here, I can start using the, the uh, fields in the data itself in order to filter the data. So let's say I only care about re residential, uh, residential gas usage. I can copy its field name here and then add that as a parameter to my request. And just say I want building service type class, type service class, and residential. So you can see here, all I've done is build onto my URL that equality statement, building type service class equals residential, and I'm going to be filtering my output types to return just the kind of data that I want. You can do that with any of the fields in the data set. You can combine things together as well. So maybe I only want to get con ed um, sourced residential power. So I can I can and those things together simply by adding additional uh, fields onto that URL as parameters. If you want to make deeper queries, if you want to um, make more complicated queries, you can use what we call SQL. So SQL is a query language we we devised based on SQL, as you might guess based on the name, that allows you to break up the different filtering criteria you might use in SQL into different URL parameters on a RESTful request. So if I go back to my data set here, get rid of the filters I've already added. Uh, let's say I only want to get, um, let's, let's, let's say we want to, only want to get uh, zip codes that, that you have very high power usage. So let's uh, look at getting only consumption in gigajoules, I think that's must be, of greater than 60,000. Let's try that. So I'm going to use a where clause. So you know, notice the difference between my previous uh, URL parameters, where I did not have a docs in front of it, and these. These are special SQL parameters. Uh, the, they're namespaced by that dollar sign in front of them. Then I can pass in my query as the value for that, or consumption in gigajoules is greater than 60,000. and I get back only those zip codes with very high power usage. I could also AND that together with something else. Let's say I only wanted to get residential. I could add an AND into that. And then building type service class equal residential. Just like I could do with a SQL statement. You can also combine these uh, these different types of query parameters. I could, for example, add an equality filter and that's, that is exactly equivalent to that previous statement that I did. Just add those statements together and you can mix together SQL statements and simple filters uh, to your content. It makes it really easy to build up a query by adding additional uh, parameters to your request. Uh, if you have questions about how all these things work, they're all documented on our dev site as well. So all the different software clauses you can use along with the different functions you can perform for different data types are all documented within our developer documentation. Uh, you can even use uh, richer query types, richer query functions like within Circle uh, in order to do geoquery. This is really useful when you have a geospatial data set, say crimes or 
locations of resources within a city and you're looking for something near a user's location, you can use within circle to look that up. So if I go back to my hurl console again, I can modify my request here and get things within a certain range or something. So I can use a where statement within circle. Then you need to provide, within circle is a function that, that takes several parameters. The first parameter is the field name of the location column that you want to query on, and then the latitude and longitude, and then the range in meters. So we're metric here at Socratic. Um, we're going to grab our location column, which is called zip code, and then the latitude and longitude, which I will cheat on because I do not know by heart the latitude and longitude in New York City. And the range, let's say, uh, number of meters is pretty short in New York City. So you can see here we retrieve just the five zip codes that are within 500 meters of that particular, oh, the five, the five building entries, rather, the five building entries that are within 500 meters of that zip code, along with their power usage. Uh, one of the important things to understand about the Socrata API when you're building an application, especially one that deals with more data, uh, is that uh, requests are paged. So by default, uh, you'll get 1,000 requests per page. If you want to get additional results, you'll need to use limit and offset to change that. So if I was building a uh, client to page through this data set here, I would add those two parameters. Let's say I wanted to do 50 things in a page. Um, if I wanted to get the first page, I'd use an offset to zero. If I want to get the second page, I'd use an offset of 50. And you can just step through the data set in that manner. If you want to get more data at one time, you can use an offset, uh, sorry, limit right now of as high as 10,000. Take a little bit longer, but you get the entire data set in one swap with less than 10,000 records. There are also export options if you want to pull down the entire data set for, uh, for analysis or something like that. Another important thing to understand uh, is application tokens. So every developer, uh, if you're using the API, you can use it without an app token, as you've seen me do so far, to a limited extent, and it's throttled by IP address. And so you'll get up to probably about 100 requests per hour from a given IP address without using an app token at all. If you want to make more, uh, you need to register for an app token. So you go to dev.circuit.com slash register. Log into your account. And then by filling out a little form here with just basically the name and description of your application. I understand that you're still in kind of development mode, so it doesn't need to be super uh, specific quite yet. That'll get you an app token that you can copy into your application. App tokens uh, do not by themselves um, provide any authentication or authorization. It simply identifies your application as an entity. It allows us to, uh, to throttle your requests independently from other developers. So by putting an app token in your request, you'll get your own private pool starting at 1,000 requests per hour uh, that nobody else can impede on. So you don't have to worry about a really popular data set um, or you know, your, your developer running in a very popular IP address, like a hackathon, for example, uh, impeding their ability to use the API. Uh, in order to use that app token, you can either pass it as a header or as a parameter. So if I wanted to add an app token to my URL request here, I could add a header, X uh, token, uh, to my request, and then I'll pass it along to our servers. Along with the request. So if I actually look at my request here, there's my app token, uh, it gets passed in the headers. Uh, the equivalent to that is I could also do this in a parameter. 
using the double dollar sign app underscore token. The double dollar sign is a way of us saying this is not a SQL parameter, it's a Socrata parameter. That is equivalent to adding it as a header. That's really useful if you're doing development in something like JavaScript uh, or another um, environment where adding headers is more difficult. You can do it all just as, um, as parameters to the URL. So let's, uh, just for fun, let's uh, do something simple here. So one of the things I actually want to talk about as well is getting help. Let's, go through, let's do help first, and then I'll show you some of the fun. So getting help, once you start working with the API, you're bound to have some questions. The best place to start is on our developer portal, dev.secreta.com, which I've been showing you a little bit. Our dev portal includes uh, getting started guides and examples uh, for both developers and data publishers. You guys are probably most concerned with the things within the app developers menu here. Uh, and then also API doc. So API doc contains you know, the specific uh, RESTful API level documentation for all the different functions you can do with Soda and Sockle. So things like how to perform simple filters, how to uh, perform Sockle queries and the different parameters you can use, um, as well as for particular data types, the kinds of queries you can issue with them. There are a lot of examples as well. So we use what we call cookbooks to explain uh, more specific topics that might be useful for particular data sets. This one is around uh, looking up um, uh, some data set for anonymization. They have block level data. So you have the start and end of a block range along with the street name. You can detail about how to use the different parts of SQL to query the data set like that. So there's lots of examples of very specific use cases um, that you can use on the API. Uh, if you uh, would like a library to get started with, so we have uh, a number of SDKs and libraries for different languages on dev.jerkrider.com slash libraries. I understand there's a lot of debate as to whether or not people want to start with a library or a Ruby gem or whatever on, when they're using the API, they'd rather build on their own. We like to support both models. So we provide client libraries in a number of really popular languages, Java, Ruby, PHP, Scala, even Swift, the new uh, Apple development language for iOS. Uh, we also have community libraries developed by our community of uh, customers and developers for things like .NET and R. So you can take these libraries uh, and uh, they all support most of the SQL query functionality we've talked about so far uh, and build with them rather than building directly with the API. Uh, if, if you encounter problems, uh, you can uh, get help uh, in person in a lot of hackathons. We, we tend to pe send people. We have an RSC chat room that a number of us hang out with on Freenode. So you can come and ask questions. Uh, if you're not an IRC nerd like we are, you can actually get, get into RSC chat through using uh, a web IRC client that we provide on the dev site. You can just sign on here uh, and ask questions live, generally during business hours here in Seattle. Uh, we also watch Stack Overflow. So rather than having our own independent developer forum, we use Stack Overflow to tap into that community. Uh, if you ask a question using the Soda or Socrata tag, uh, we'll get notified about that and we'll come uh, help you out directly on that form as well. So next, let's, uh, let's do some of the fun. So I understand there's probably people with a lot of different backgrounds and a lot of different abilities uh, on, the, on the webinar. So what I'm going to do is show you something really simple and web-based that I used last week that people were really excited about. So I'm actually going to go to Google Drive. and show you a really simple, low bar way of the computer catches up. There we go. I'm getting data from the Socrata API into a spreadsheet. Uh, kind of shows you the power that, that you can use, you get on the Socrata API. So if I go back to my curl query here, let's say I want to get uh, residential Let's, let's look at the at the highest power usage residential buildings in New York City. So I have another parameter here, which we'll use the service class. So we're going to grab all the residential building type service classes. Let's look at everything above 60,000 again. So we'll rebuild basically that same query we before.
Okay, so I could I could interact with this as a JSON uh, data set, or what I really want to do is get that in my spreadsheet. So you might say, oh, I can just grab the CSV by changing the output type. So as I talked about earlier, that format extension uh, allows you to uh, change the output type of the API. I'm going to change that from JSON to CSV. And you can see now I'm getting my data output in a CSV format. I can take that URL Any good questions coming up yet, by the way? No, nothing. Okay, if you guys have questions, don't be shy, by the way. Uh, feel free to, to put them in the chat window or raise your hand using a little hand button in uh, GoTo meeting. Uh, and I've got my, uh, my coworker, Tom, here watching the questions and letting me know if anything comes up. So I'm just going to grab this URL here that would be my API request. I can take that right within uh, Google Sheets here and pull that data in so I can work with it here. So there's a, a kind of not so well-known function uh, in uh, Google Sheets, and there's actually an equivalent in Excel as well, called import data. It allows me to just pass in a URL to a CSV. And it grabs all that data as, uh, as basically a web request. So this data now is a live query to the web. So Google's going to keep this up to date as New York City updates this data set. Uh, and it'll automatically update anything that they do with this. So I can, for example, uh, come in here and maybe I want to make a pivot table. Select stuff here. Why are you being weird? There's one per zip code. Let's, actually, let's do it. Let's do a chart. I think a chart would be more fun. Let's insert a chart here. Oh, lovely. Live demos. Column chart. That's not a very useful chart. The heck of a time for, there we go. Uh, okay, I need to pick a better data type for this. Let's, uh, let's change this a little bit. Can I do all these? I don't know why it does not like that zip code column. I could present, let's do a pivot table. I can at least show a pivot table and then we can do a chart on pivot table. So I can do a pivot table report on this. And I can say let's pivot it by building type. And then we'll add in the Assumption data. So we can we can start manipulating this data from within uh, Excel without Excel within within uh, Google Sheets uh, without uh, needing to worry about keeping it up to date. Let's actually we'll do a better integration here. We'll do uh, data source because I know there's going to be one more. Oh, all content. Great. Okay, but you can get the idea of what I could do with that here. This is really useful if you want to pull data into other systems, into ETLs, into um, you know, keeping an uh, internal system up to date, you can just grab that CSV format and load that right in. Okay, now let's talk about, I've become fabulously successful. What do I do with my open data app? So you've built your open data app. You, you've got something that you, you think that uh, you'd like to get out to the community that, that people might want to buy or at least learn more about. So what you can do is publish that app into the Socrata app marketplace uh, and get it more exposure. So the Socrata app marketplace provides a lot of benefits. Uh, it's exposure to more citizen users, so it's not targeted specifically at governments or citizens. It's just a place to come learn 
about open data apps. Uh, it helps expose you to citizen, both citizen users and also to the government customers that Socrata serves uh, and helps get your app uh, out there into those um, in those markets where it might get lost in something like uh, you know the Apple uh, the Apple iPhone store for example uh, it's going to reach the markets that really matter to it in the Socrata marketplace. Uh, we'll also help you uh, develop and vandalize data standards. So if you become a Socrata certified app with a data standard, we'll help push that data standard into our customer base. So let's say you build a really great app uh, about uh, the location of dog parks, one of my favorite examples. Uh, we can, and, and you build a schema around that, a standard, we can encourage our customers to adopt that standard and make it easier for you to build your app against those things. Uh, being in the app Socratic marketplace also gives you additional support from our team in mentoring uh, for questions and issues you might have with the Socratic API and just gives you more access to us here at Socratic. Oops. Down. Uh, if you'd like to submit your app, it's pretty easy. So if you go to socratacom slash apps slash submit app and provide a little background information on yourself uh, and your application, um, then, uh, then we can get started on that. So there's a little bit more than is required for normal token registration, and that's very deliberate. This is, this is like submitting your application to you know, the, the Apple App Store. Uh, we need a lot more detail about what you're actually uh, building. So things like uh, your uh, name and phone number so we can contact you if customers have problems. Uh, a lot more detail about the app, including you know, uh, kind of a marketing blurb that will go into your entry, uh, details about what it's for, what kind of customer it serves, the license on it, whether it's open source or it's something people pay for, uh, images like screenshots and icons, all these things that kind of build out your profile in that, in that app store. So if we go to the actual marketplace, you can see what one of these profiles looks like. So detail about you know the the actual uh, use case of the app, version information, platforms it runs on, etc. These are all things that go into your profile in that app store. So once you submit that. Um, that request to the App Store, we'll review it, uh, and we'll decide uh, you know, if there's any additional information we need from you in order to get you into that marketplace. So Socrata Certified Apps. We get a lot of questions about what it means for not to be a certified app. Socrata Certified Apps are basically apps that we've, uh, we at Socrata have uh, vetted and we have a little bit deeper relationship with those app developers uh, in order to give our customers a little higher confidence with them. So one of the things require is an approved uh, data schema. People get a little confused about what that one actually means. Data schema is not your database schema that you use internally. It's the format of the data. It's the, it's the, the standard for the structure of the data that, that the Socrata customer would provide in order to get their data into your app. Uh, so for example, if it, in my dog parks example, it would be the schema of the data set that um, you would prefer to receive for that. So things like dog park name, hours, um, you know, how many you know, square foot it is, um, you know, its location, things like that. That schema defines the data that you're going to get from our customers uh, in order to feed into your app. What that allows us to do is kind of help you find data sets that might be applicable and help us encourage uh, or help our customers to get them into that schema so you can make use of them. Uh, being a Socrata certified app as well, because uh, it shows a deeper trust between we at Socrata and you as an application developer also speeds you know, the acquisition of your app by our customers. Uh, if it's something that you know, they're looking to buy, it means a little bit more for us, for us to say, hey, we have a partnership with this app. Uh, so we, we trust them and they trust us. So it builds confidence with those buyers and, and helps them understand a little bit more about how that works. Any questions about uh, the Socrata app submission process? Um, or how uh, you get your app in the store. It looks like there's a couple that have popped up in here. Um, so one question from uh, David Quinn is about how does pricing work for apps? Do you take a percentage of anyone who buys it? So right now we're not taking a percentage on any apps. This is merely kind of a kind of an introductory, introductory service, a directory service to help people find about these apps uh, in order so that we can help um, help our customers find the open data apps that matter for them. 
Are there any more questions about? Uh, there's a few questions here, not all about. I think that's the only one on the marketplace itself. There's a couple questions on the API from our previous topic that I can try and walk through here too. Okay, so I'm going to just go top to bottom here and I'm going to try and answer as many as I can. So now we've gone into the question section. Let's skip over the hiring slide. We can talk about what questions we've got uh, and review these. Okay, so Jordan says, um, Uh, okay, I am, I've been developing state open data apps for 10 years. Interesting in learning the best way to utilize larger data sets that update frequently. Uh, how can we communicate more most efficiently? So uh, we're not going to be able to give you access directly to our databases, but what we can do is help you learn how to structure queries so that uh, you can efficiently get just the things that have changed since the last time you've updated. So a lot of data sets, if you look at them, uh, this one is not one of them. Let's talk about how you get changes to data sets. So what's a good example on New York City? All right. Give me something that's a little easier to filter on. There we go. Let's look at just data sets. So one, one good trick you can actually use if you're looking for data sets that update frequently is on the data catalog, you can change the order to be recently updated. What I've done here is I've filtered it to only return with data sets uh, and to order the results as recently updated. So let's look at this permit data set and we'll see if you wanted to pull permit data, how you might be able to get just the updates on that. So if we look at this, let's make sure there's a, okay, let's look at the data here. So within this data set, you'll see we actually have a column that is uh, issuing this date. And this is a, a plain text one. One of the difficulties is sometimes these, the, uh, date, the structure of the data is dependent on what the publisher puts up. So sometimes you find data that doesn't have the right data type. Here we go. This one has a data type. Or you find cases like that where there's a, there's a column which is an inappropriate data type. One of the best things to do is to submit a support ticket um, through the getting help section on the dev site and we can let the customer know to fix it. So the DOB run date, this is actually looking at the description here exactly what we want to find. Day one query is when it pushed to open data. It could be used to differentiate report dates. So if we wanted to take this data set here, Grab that URL, pull that over into curl. Uh, TB pit permit insurance. Scroll out here and grab its field name. Where at a where query. DOB run date is greater than, let's say we want to get just the stuff that happened since yesterday. 0929. This would return us just the things that came in since yesterday. So that's just going to give us all the records that were updated since yesterday. So within the data, you can usually find a way of getting just the most recent updates. If you have a, this is really useful if you have a giant data set. So if you're looking at something like crimes or permit issuance for a big city like, uh, like New York City, you can grab just the updates since the particular date by using those date queries. Uh, okay, so Jordan has given me a different data set he wants me to take a look at here. So this data set, there isn't a run date, but there is a violation date. So you can do the same thing using that violation date column, just to get the violations that came in since the last time you updated your version of the data. That would be the, the suggestion that I would actually use on that data set. 
It's not going to be called the same thing on every data set. The structure of the data uh, is dependent on what the customer has uploaded, not on Socrata. So it really comes down a lot to what data they provide about it. Okay, let's look for the next question here. Ramona asked if there will be more documentation that explains each data set. So uh, the documentation, so the actual metadata about each data set is maintained by the customer. So like for this data set, for example, you have all of the description metadata and the descriptions they put on the columns themselves, which talk about uh, that particular data set uploaded by the city of New York. So the, the customer provides that. We also have uh, some technology we're working on that basically allow us to provide uh, data set specific API documentation. Um, so that would uh, allow us to basically provide a specific API, doc API document for each different API for each different data set. That'll help you a little bit in using the API on that particular data set. Uh, David asked if we're going to be able to share the URL of the presentation. We will do that. There'll be a follow-up email. Uh, my slides are all posted on GitHub, so you can find them there. Uh, and uh, I think we're also recording this as well, so we'll post the recording later on, too. All right. Uh, David also asks um, how we handle versioning of data over time and how is there consistency in attribute names across cities. So versioning of data over time is largely dependent on uh, how the actual customer chooses to push data into that data set. Um, sometimes data, the customers completely overwrite the data set, so you'll see the changes as they come in. Other times, uh, you know, they'll, for example, have uh, a data set where they simply add records to it. So it really depends a lot, data set by data set, what that looks like. It comes down to the structure of that data itself. Uh, consistency of attribute names across cities, that's where those, uh, those data schemas come in. So that's where, um, as um, a developer in that app marketplace, uh, the, uh, those app schemas will allow us to kind of push down those standards into those different cities in order to encourage them to do that. Right now, there's no, uh, no specific uh, restriction on what kind of uh, attribute names they can use on different data sets in different cities. Another thing we're working on in that regard is, is what we call the Open Data Network, which is all about taking similar data sets from different cities uh, and uh, making them more consistent through, through other data standards as this product pushes down. Uh, so Varun asks if uh, there's any plan to add analytic functions to SACL. Uh, so there are some analytic functions built in. So if you look at our, where's my tool here? So within SACL, uh, you can do some simple SQL style aggregation, uh, like grouping and aggregation. So you can, for example, find the average power usage per zip code from that data set in the city of New York. Um, but we don't provide deep specific function like you might actually be looking for. So in that case, you might have to actually download that data set and use another tool. Uh, in the future, we are looking at how to include um, you know, the ability to you do, use tools like R and greater integration with the platform uh, or really do deeper analysis. But right now, it's mostly about getting data out for use in applications. Mm. To the questions here. Let me answer that one. Uh, Varun also asks, is there a way to get a metadata uh, metadata on data sets in a given data portal? The easiest way to actually do that uh, is through the data.json endpoints on the site itself. So slash data.json is a federal standard for uh, basically the, the catalog schema. Uh, for a data site. So that's going to pull down. That'll give us a machine readable JSON document containing uh, all of the data sets uh, on the City of New York catalog. There we go. So here's a, the machine readable catalog for that site. All different ways you can access that data set. Uh, the contact information for how to get help, metadata, etc. All right, Jordan. It sounds like you might have some additional questions uh, about uh, how to access that particular data set. Um, if you'd like to contact me, I'll put my contact info up in a second. Um, I can you know, get our account manager to maybe talk to the customer about that particular data set, see if we can improve it for you. 
I think that is most of the questions we had. And we're getting near the end of our hour, so if you have any last-minute questions, um, feel free to stick them in the chat window right now, uh, or you can contact me uh, at... So my contact info is chris.metcalf.com. You have a contact slide, but I didn't do it this time. So if you have any questions, you can contact me there. Um, if you'd like to also copy supports, that's acquire.com. That'll create a uh, trouble ticket as well, so we can kind of track your request and so on. Our support team can help as well. So email me at chris.metcalf.com and ccsupport.com if you have questions. So Jordan, if you can please do that. We'll, uh, we'll try and take care of your question as well. Cool. Looks like there's no more question, guys. I'd like to thank you, and hopefully you guys found this useful, uh, and you should watch out for that follow-up email with links and more details.